It is Friday, September 2nd. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today is the launch of The Last of Us Part 1 on PS5. So uh, despite how you feel about the game, if you are buying it and playing it today, I do hope you have a great time with it. And uh, of course, we'll talk about that game later. But first, as always, our PlayStation Plus reminder. So this is your last call for the August PlayStation Plus Essential Games. September 6th, it's going to change over to Need for Speed Heat on PS4. Also, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, PS4 as well. And then Toem on PS5. Uh, another really solid good month for PlayStation Plus Essential. Ever since the relaunch, I find it's been way better, especially because Essential has been largely unchanged, right? It's still just three games, uh, two on PS4, one on PS5. Normally, sometimes there's a bonus game or a bonus PSVR game. Sometimes two games have PS5 versions. But overall, uh, Essential seems to be much better. I really hope they keep up this momentum. Also, a little bit weird, but uh, it's only been our third upcoming refresh for PS Plus Extra and Premium, and now Sony is doing those announcements early, or as in they're doing them right now alongside the Essential lineup. So we know what the PS Plus Extra and Premium games are going to be, but they still will not go live until the midpoint in the month, which this time around would be September 20th. But for PlayStation Plus Extra, a uh, pretty good lineup here. We've got Deathloop on PlayStation 5, only on PS5, but... That is definitely the headlining game for PS Plus Extra this time around. Also, Assassin's Creed Origins. You've got Watch Dogs 2 on there. Uh, Chicory, A Colorful Tale. That's a really great game. Also, uh, some smaller stuff like Alex Kidd and Miracle World DX. But you've got uh, Rabbids Invasion, Rayman Legends, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Not really too much filler. And again, way more than what we normally saw with PS Now. So, for the third month of PS Plus Extra, it's been excellent. It's been really, really good. And we actually do have some games for PlayStation Plus Premium this time around. So for September, again, these go live on the 20th. Siphon Filter 2 on PlayStation 1. The Sly Collection for PS3 streaming. Also Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. Bentley's Hack Pack. Toy Story 3, the PSP game. And finally, Kingdom of Paradise on PSP, which is yet again another Sony published IP. Uh, now, that's not really a problem or a bad thing per se. I love seeing old PlayStation classics come back, but we're starting to see how Sony's been handling premium so far, where there's not that many games that get added, but when they do, usually it's Sony leaning into their own library. Again, not a bad thing, but um, you have to work with outside third parties and those properties and get those games back as well. I want to see all games come back and have some availability, and that's why the number one criticism of premium so far tends to be that there's just no classics being added. So, yes, I would love more PS1, more PSP. Uh, we have still yet to see a brand new PS2 game get added, uh, but the really confusing thing about this month is the PS3 streaming, because they brought back the Sly games, and they were not gone for very long, so... For those that remember, this was right before uh, the PlayStation Plus relaunch. They were there in the PlayStation Now catalog, and during that relaunch period and that transition, right towards the end, a lot of licenses were expiring for third-party games, but also after the transition, we lost a lot of PlayStation 3 streaming and first-party PS3 games that conceivably we did not need to lose because why would Sony take those down? So we were theorizing at the time why they did that. You know, maybe some PS3 old server blades were being uh, taken down and out of commission. Um, perhaps native remasters were on the way or something, uh, which would have been super cool, obviously. But it's just, there. there's no reason why they would have done this. Uh, one theory at the time was maybe they're being taken out so they can be re-added in the monthly lineups. And, uh, you know, that seemed kind of... I don't know, I, I, I just didn't think they'd do that, but here they are doing it, more or less, with brand new promo images made intact and all, so that's just really weird that they're doing this, um, and really they're also, I mean, it highlights how often, or it, it highlights how people did not know about PlayStation Now, or they didn't care what was in that catalog, because some are seeing this and going, wow, they brought back the Sly games, that's a huge deal, but they were there, like, not even not even six months ago. They've been in PS Now for quite a while, uh, playable before PlayStation 5 came out on PS4. I don't remember when they were added, but it's just, uh, this was a really weird circumstance, so maybe they're going to bring back Killzone now or something. I, I don't really know, but uh, for the time being, at least, the same criticisms are intact. That's uh, Essential being much better, uh, Extra being excellent, and Premium needing work.
Next up, The Last of Us Part 1 is finally out, so like I mentioned at the top of the show, if you're playing it today, really, I hope you have a great time. It's something where it's always fun when a big game comes out and you're either uh, you know, taking the day off for it or you can't wait to come home and play it, so always a really exciting time. And uh, of course, the reviews dropped on Wednesday, and that's where the game naturally scored quite well. Uh, I think the last time I checked, it was an 89 on Metacritic across over 100 different reviews, which, you know, whether you like the game or, or not, or you're upset about the price, you have to remember it's still a remake of a critically acclaimed game that some consider one of the best ever. So yeah, it was going to score quite well, um, which some have wondered why the game did not score more than the original, but that seems to be a trend usually. Uh, not only is a remake often scrutinized by more publications versus when the original came out, but you know, there's still certainly cases to be made about how to judge a remake. Um, sometimes there is missing content, which in this case there is no faction, so that can certainly be... Um, a reason why the game doesn't score as high you can't really get hung up too much on that and as i often said with the whole price debacle i feel you should not judge the price because it won't stay 70 dollars forever so some places did look at price uh, but that's their choice that's their prerogative uh, but all around the game did review very well and Prior to the game coming out, even before the reviews, right, it's something where it's almost like the game was already available because of because uh, of broken street dates. So there was already so much footage out there showing a lot more of the game. But now that it's out, there's also the reviews. There's Digital Foundry, uh, really good analysis there. So we're seeing exactly to what extent Naughty Dog went to really remake this game from the ground up, as they said. Which you know I pointed out, you can't necessarily just judge the comparisons of pre-rendered cutscenes versus the real-time cutscenes on PS5, which already looked very impressive, but it's the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in those environments where you're going to see a dramatic difference, and that is definitely what we're seeing. Um, even those small gameplay tweaks and modifiers go a long way to make the game a lot more playable, so that's great to see. All around, it's just Naughty Dog proving yet again they can really take something and just run with it. Moving on to our next story, we have a rumor from the independent reporter Tom Henderson, this time writing again for Xbuter.com, uh, claiming that allegedly we'll have some Discord voice chat functionality coming to PlayStation consoles within the coming months. So apparently this is the same source that provided info on the DualSense Pro Controller, which we now know to be true as the DualSense Edge was revealed very recently. And also, uh, apparently this implementation of Discord has been in the quality assurance stage and progressing smoothly. But over on Twitter, Tom provided an update on this a few days later stating that the current beta firmware that we're in is going to go live around September 7th and then the next major update which will include this discord functionality will go live around March 8th 2023 which I'm not sure where he's getting that exact date uh, I assume he means around that time because there's no way he's going to know exactly when the next major firmware update is going to go out when we don't even know what it is or what it's going to include beyond discord but uh at the very least i assume it's a timeline and that's good to know if it's the same source and it's reliable but um of course we're expecting a uh, tighter discord functionality and i certainly hope it's a lot better than what microsoft got with the discord voice chat finally going live over there where you kind of have to jump through a bunch of hoops set up the smartphone app and also log in in a weird way and enable it it's, it's just Something where, with all that in there, you're not going to want to use it. So having it baked right into the console UI um, would be way more easy and accessible to access your Discord friends and servers and make crossplay way easier to manage and things like that. So I hope that's what it looks like uh, to the point where it might even cannibalize the basic PSN messaging system. Not sure how they're going to go about doing that, but perhaps we won't have to wait too long to see what it will look like. Now, getting into PlayStation VR 2, not only are we so close to finally having some kind of big info drop come out about this headset because it's coming out early next year and also it's going to be playable at TGS in two weeks uh, for the first time to the public, but recently, Sony Interactive Entertainment's Yasuo Takahashi and also Kenjo Akiyama were speaking during the Computer Entertainment Developers Conference and discussing PSVR 2, what it's like to work on it, things like that. Um, a lot of stuff that we already knew, but they did go into some uh, pretty good detail about what it is like to actually work on it. And one of the key principles is really making sure it's as accessible as possible to work on this headset. Uh, noting that it doesn't matter if the game is a standard 2D PS5 title or if it's from a different VR headset in general, PSVR 2 uses the same SDK as PS5 and 
because of the standardized button layout on the Sense controllers, there's fewer barriers to work around on porting from a different VR platform. They're also incorporating some essential tools here to help scale pixel density on the fly and implementing tools that help teams diagnose issues immediately. Uh, really going all out to make it as accessible as possible. It seems like a key pillar of this headset, which, you know, we heard about that as a rumor um, earlier this year that Sony wants to really make it uh, simple when it comes to possibly going for this hybrid approach of uh, the game can be a 2D PS5 title as normal, or it can be a full scale VR game, um, which kind of goes in the opposite direction of games should be made from the ground up for the VR experience, but uh, certainly things change over time. And I think Sony's really at this point prioritizing just getting key software support, especially for the current thriving VR platforms like the MetaQuest where there's well, there's plenty of software over there that can easily find a home on PlayStation VR 2 as a more premium experience. And Sony certainly does want to make it so that it's mutually beneficial for the developers in getting those games over and those games being available for PS VR 2 potential owners and ensuring a long-term healthy flow of new games coming out. Um, you don't want that first year to be front-loaded with all the good stuff, and then after the novelty of the headset wears off, all the games go away and there's nothing good coming out. Um, we've seen before how a developer-first mindset really pays dividends for Sony long-term, and it's great to see they're doing that with PSVR 2. Moving on to our next story, it looks like a new PS5 model should be available very soon, uh, as in globally, because right now it's available in Australia, and it should be shipping to Japan in about two weeks, uh, right next to when the price increase goes into effect. But if you remember back in May of this year, we actually heard about these consoles where Sony uh, received certifications for updated radio equipment in these consoles, and at the time it was listed as the CFI 1200 series, and now we're seeing for the consoles in Australia, that is indeed what these machines are. Of course, principally, they're the same outside, no major chassis design or anything like that. It still looks like a PS5, as you'd expect. But um, we did see on the box for the listed weight, it is indeed lighter. So this PS5 model, which in Australia is the CFI 1202A, is 600 grams lighter than the launch PS5. And we're talking about the disc console here, uh, or about 300 grams lighter than the previous model, which was the CFI 1100 series. As for the digital console, that's about 500 grams lighter than the launch digital console or 200 grams lighter than the last one, which if you remember that whole debacle, that was when Sony released a new PS5 revision. Uh, then the YouTuber Austin Evans did a teardown, found that Sony moved some things around obviously, cause that's what it was. It was an internal mod revision. They got rid of, uh, they downsized the heatsink, got rid of some copper, and that's how they were able to make that thing lighter than the launch PS5s. Uh, but that also stirred some controversy around is it worse? Is it technically a, a PS5? You should avoid this, that, and the other, which, you know, as we discussed at the time, Sony has telemetry on their end to see, you know, how the consoles are performing. Do they need that much overhead for cooling? This, that, and the other, right? So uh, after that was all said and done, of course, there was no really major concern. It's still a normal PS5 that should operate and run just as fine as the, the launch models. And, um, you know, that's why they were 300 grams lighter. And so now we've got this. Uh, so at some point there's going to be a teardown. I'm sure that'll be interesting to see based on who does it and, and what they say. I would caution, don't worry too much about what you hear or, you know, what is said when these models are, you know, when we see some, uh, shots of the inside and what Sony did, but we knew a long time ago that Sony was going to be, uh, looking for different part suppliers. They could certainly be changing things around inside to where they got the weight down a bit more, uh, changing certain metals to maybe plastic where they can, or, uh, maybe downsizing the heatsink even more. We just, we don't really know just yet, but, um, it could be something where this is going to streamline the PS5 manufacturing process, get more consoles out there. And, um, I don't think Sony would do that to the detriment of making a, a worse console or making it not last nearly as long. Uh, I wouldn't say that just yet, but we'll see eventually at some point. Next up, it looks like God of War Ragnarok is the cover story for Game Informer's next issue. Uh, they put out a beautiful cover art for this upcoming issue. Looks fantastic, but also they're going to have a lot more info about this game very soon. Well, really, the info is already out there for digital subscribers, so there's already some tidbits floating around out there, but they also have new screenshots. 
new gameplay. Not a whole lot. They said four minutes total, but that's plenty for at this point where we haven't really had too much in terms of brand new God of War Ragnarok footage. So there's already some clips that I'm displaying right now, and we did get some details on the combat, so let's talk about that. There's these new weapon signature moves in the game. This lets Kratos fuse weapons with ice or fire elemental attacks. So for the Leviathan Axe, that move is called Frost Awaken, and for the Blades of Chaos, it's called Whiplash. Also, shields have been reworked a bit. The Stonewall shield won't allow you to parry, but it lets you absorb incoming damage, and you can sort of gamble with how much damage you can take, and then try to use that to release it as a shockwave attack. But the Dauntless shield allows you to parry, and hitting this at the very last moment will unleash a huge attack, stunning the enemy and throwing them up in the air. And that's really all we have right now, but again, there's going to be more details and, you know, anecdotes coming out in the coming days and weeks. And I think as of today, Game Informer has another video going up relatively soon, which will showcase more of the game. So basically, we're we're here. Game Informer has the, has the scoop on, you know, finally some new details about the game because, you know, Sony Santa Monica has been so uh, tight-lipped about this one, which is fine. We're fairly close enough as is to the game, and we're also fairly close to... Again, another PlayStation event or showcase, which God of War may or may not be there, because uh, again, this game should surely command its own state of play or something like that. But we are very close, and now we're finally getting some info. Now, strap yourselves in, because we have a somewhat lengthy update on the ongoing Silent Hill rumor, Konami possibly bringing that franchise back alongside Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania, uh, Sony may be involved in some way with PlayStation timed exclusivity, which is why we've been watching this rumor for a bit. And, uh, well, recently what happened was Konami confirmed their TGS lineup, and the one notable thing in there was they did confirm a brand new game announcement, but the way they labeled it is what's really interesting is that they called it a series which is loved all around the world, and that's why everyone is now looking at this wondering what they're going to announce. But, um... A source speaking with VGC says that reveal is likely a smaller project and not one related to the rumored revivals for Castlevania, Metal Gear Solid, and Silent Hill. Then, shortly after this report, Andy Robinson put out this tweet saying, and I quote, I've now heard from several people that a Silent Hill reveal may be sooner than I suggested in my story today. As with all reporting on timings, I wouldn't take that as gospel, but fans possibly won't have to wait much longer. As a reminder for this long-running Silent Hill rumor, it's two projects, a Silent Hill 2 remake from Bloober Team with timed exclusivity for PlayStation, and the other, an episodic series of Silent Hill games at a studio under Annapurna Interactive. And going back to May of this year, that's when we had those leaked images come out that were DMCA'd, and those were allegedly from another Silent Hill game with possible Sony involvement. And that's why this rumor kind of runs deep here, but at least we're getting somewhat closer to having an idea of what these games are, who they're being made by, and if Sony is involved or if they're not. And at this point, I would not be shocked at all if Sony is indeed trying to secure some of these games in some way, right? So not necessarily something where they're exclusive in perpetuity, but we've seen how Sony loves to do a uh, pretty lengthy timed exclusive, so at least a one-year minimum, but we're seeing that oftentimes they will either they'll either extend that or they'll just outright go for two years right off the top. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's what's going on here. And not to say that we're going to see it at TGS relatively soon, especially because that would be kind of unusual. TGS isn't quite what it used to be, so they don't necessarily always do the kind of announcements that you would think should show up at, let's say, a PlayStation Showcase or the Game Awards. Um, so I wouldn't expect it at TGS, but that means we might see it at those things that I just listed. Uh, so before the year ends, we do have some big events still coming up. And especially if Sony is the one involved in these projects, they would certainly want to announce that on their terms, which would be a showcase. Next up, we finally have another PlayStation acquisition, and for most people, it's not quite what they were expecting. Sony has acquired Savage Game Studios, a newly formed mobile developer for their newly formed mobile division. So just for some background on Savage Game Studios, they were founded back in 2020 with a lot of veteran staff that worked on that worked in mobile. So uh, developers like Rovio, Zynga, Wargaming, they started development on a shooter back in 2021 and they have two studios, one in Helsinki and one in Berlin. And this was when they raised some capital for this, this first project of theirs. And now they've joined PlayStation Studios as the first developer for their mobile initiative. Over on the PlayStation blog, the head of PS Studios, Herman Hall says, and I quote here, 
As we assured you before with our plans to bring select titles to PC, our efforts beyond console in no way diminish our commitment to the PlayStation community, nor our passion to keep making amazing single-player narrative-driven experiences. Our mobile gaming efforts will be similarly additive, providing more ways for more people to engage with our content and striving to reach new audiences unfamiliar with PlayStation and our games. Savage Game Studios is joining a newly created PlayStation Studios mobile division, which will operate independently from our console development and focus on innovative, on-the-go experiences based on new and existing PlayStation IP. Their first game is now being described as a AAA mobile live service action game. Now, I know some folks are going to be surprised by this, but we do have to remember, and you might remember if you've been keeping up with LTPS, that they've been forming this PlayStation Studios mobile team for a while now. That was back when they hired Nicholas Sebastiani, formerly of Apple Arcade, to be the head of the PlayStation Studios new mobile division. And uh, they've also been, there's been job listings popping up left and right, outfitting this team. We don't cover every one of them, obviously, but we knew this initiative was coming and it was more an inevitability of them picking up a developer. We just didn't know how they were going to go about doing it, right? Would it be a brand new team? Would they form it themselves? Um, would they pick up a large established mobile developer because they have no footprint in the space? There's just no precedent set of how Sony has done this, so we have no idea what they are going to do. But here's our first example, a recently formed studio that was looking for capital last year, and Sony at some point stepped in and you know, they worked out a deal, which, um, I mean, this is not, uh, it's just, it's not surprising. We have to also remember that Sony is not a stranger to the mobile space. Uh, their last major push, I guess we could say, is PlayStation Mobile back around the launch of PlayStation Vita shortly after. I'm well aware of that initiative because I was one of the few actually buying and playing those games to review on this YouTube channel. So the PSM games were available on PS Vita and a bunch of other Android handsets. That was a whole branded initiative Sony did and it went away very quickly because it was not successful. And that's why I've often been wary about Sony getting into this space because not only is it very tough to get in, but if you're gonna do it, you better do it right. And I also find it, <laughs> not it's not surprising, but it's funny to see that, you know, Herman Hulse could not have been more clear about what this means for the average PlayStation consumer and fan. Hey, this is not disrupting the console business. They're gonna operate independently of the console business. It doesn't mean less single player, narrative driven experiences, and it doesn't matter where you read this news, people are still saying the exact opposite. So it never matters if they directly acknowledge the consumer's concerns or worry about them you know, moving away from console or single player or this, that, and the other. It never seems to matter, but as we've explained for the past two, nearly three years, Sony is in growth mode. It doesn't mean less of what they're good at. It means more of what they're not good at, which is PC, live service and multiplayer, and also mobile. They're all growth vectors for the company. My skepticism comes from how poor they've done mobile in the past. Not only PlayStation Mobile, but even more recent stuff like that Wipeout game they just kind of dropped out of nowhere, right? They do these things in a very strange way. They don't promote them or talk about them or make a big deal. Some random developer making a Wipeout game, they just, it's so strange how they do this stuff. So I'm hoping this time around, it is a serious push in the mobile space. There is a lot of money to be made there and every console, every platform holder has been trying to break into that market. It's certainly a different market from consoles. That's why I think Sony is finally wising up to the idea that if they're gonna do it, they have to do it right, form a brand new division, teams that are tailor-made to work on this kind of content. Um, and look, I'm not into mobile stuff, I'm, I'm really not. The only mobile game I really play a lot of is Pokemon Go, which I find to be an outlier because it's an AR experience. I only play it when I'm outside. Uh, also, the IP is doing a lot of heavy lifting for that game, so, you know, generally speaking, I do not play mobile stuff whatsoever. And, uh, you know, so even that, I just, I don't care too much about it, but they could make some kind of very cool new IP or even a, an existing PlayStation property that is tailor-made to the smartphone experience. And that helps the PlayStation bottom line if it's successful. Maybe it does end up being a full scale game where it's got this cool cross progression across PS4, 5, PC, and mobile. And maybe the mobile experience isn't compromised at all. I mean, there's a lot of positive ways this can go. It's just a matter of if they can execute properly. I'm really not sure, but we will see. Now, in more interesting acquisition news, 
Sony Interactive Entertainment made a minority stake investment into From Software, the developers of Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and Elden Ring, which this is a separate investment from the Sony Group's uh, minority stake into Katakawa that was last year. If you remember, Sony owns a 1.93% stake in Katakawa, the parent company of From Software. But now, independently of that, Sony Interactive Entertainment has made a 14.09 minority investment into From Software directly, next to a subsidiary of Tencent. They'll also own 16.25%, and the remaining amount is Katakawa at 69.66%. The reason or the main reason cited for these investments and this raise of capital is that, and I quote here, through the implementation of the fund procurement from software will aim to proactively invest in development of more powerful game IP for itself to strengthen from software's development capabilities and will seek to establish a framework that allows the expansion of the scope of its own publishing in the significantly growing global market. So what does that all mean? Well, they want to publish on their own globally without help from an outside publisher where oftentimes they'll ask for IP ownership and then, then you're stuck with uh, what you can and can't do with that property or greenlighting a sequel or um, doing DLC, this, that, and the other, right? When you, you lose a lot of leverage when the property you work on is owned by somebody else and also money, obviously. So uh, normally with From Software, they self-publish in Japan, but when it comes to other key markets, they've needed Activision for Sekiro or Bandai Namco for all the Dark Souls games and Elden Ring. And with the recent success of Elden Ring, clearly they want to start self-publishing and uh, having more control over their IP. This is great for Katakawa too. They'll see a lot more money out of uh, self-publishing. And for Sony with this minority investment, um, well, this is a uh, most definitely some kind of hedge against the possibility of losing from software in the future. So this doesn't necessarily mean or guarantee some kind of you know exclusive game again. Of course, there is a good working relationship between Sony and from software. We've seen Demon Souls, we've seen Bloodborne. Um, they've got multiple projects in development right now. So perhaps even well before this investment, Sony secured another game that is bound to come out in the next five or six years. We don't know, that's all speculation on my part, but this investment doesn't necessarily mean they have some sort of you know better terms on getting an exclusive game or something, but it does mean they're a bit they're a bit isolated from the possibility of these games not being multi-platform, which at this point Sony has to be very mindful of in this current market. Um, and that's so ironic because Bandai Namco just made a statement like shortly before this where they, they themselves want to isolate from this possibility of losing these talented developers and these publishing opportunities that they often have they've had right so um that's what's going on here definitely a smart investment on sony's part and something where it's uh like this is how it would go for square enix where they recently put out that info that you know they want to possibly sell stakes and in their individual developers and so absolutely sony might want to pursue that versus a full acquisition as a, a more cheaper way to make sure that these games don't necessarily, they might not necessarily have to go the full mile of acquiring the entire publisher or, which I think is still a possibility obviously, but um, this was a very strategic investment and I think it's going to pay off for them. Moving on to our next story, we've got a major update on the Microsoft acquisition of Activision, Blizzard, and King Digital Entertainment. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority recently completed their Phase 1 investigation on the deal, and they've identified some concerns as to why this might move into a Phase 2, depending on Microsoft's response. So, the CMA is concerned that if Microsoft buys Activision Blizzard, it could harm rivals, including recent and future entrants into gaming, by refusing them access to Activision Blizzard games or providing access on much worse terms. This is notable because Microsoft also recently confirmed in their new blog post that big Activision franchises like Call of Duty will be made available on Game Pass. That was always assumed, but now they've confirmed it. The CMA believes that in the short to medium term, the main rival that could be affected by this conduct would be Sony. They say, and I quote here, PlayStation currently has a larger share of the console gaming market than Xbox, but the CMA considers that Call of Duty is sufficiently important that losing access to it or losing access on competitive terms could significantly impact Sony's revenues and user base. This impact is likely to be felt especially at the launch of the next generation of consoles where gamers make fresh decisions about which consoles to buy. The CMA believes that the merger could, therefore, significantly weaken Microsoft's closest rival to the detriment of overall competition in console gaming. 
So with that, the CMA wants to move on to a phase two investigation. Microsoft and Activision Blizzard have five working days to submit proposals that address the CMA's concerns, and based on the results of that, phase two will begin. Phase two is where it'll be more in-depth of an examination, with an independent panel evaluating how this would affect the market, the companies involved, and the consumers, etc. Now, this isn't really surprising at all. We're talking about a nearly $70 billion acquisition, which is in a completely different ballpark compared to what we normally see, not only in games, but even outside of games as well. So whether it's a developer that's a few hundred million, even Bungie was a, a few billion, same for Bethesda, they all kind of come and go uh, during that initial phase one look at the deal and you know the approval process. Something like this is almost surely going to go into that phase two for many regulatory bodies where they bring in an independent panel, they reach out to third parties, they, you know, ask for feedback and what this could possibly mean, and they do a very thorough look as to what could happen. And that's why we're seeing in this published document for phase one, they even mention things like how recently Microsoft acquired Bethesda, and based on public statements, those games are now going to be exclusive. So they look at things like that, and they've identified that as a concern. Uh, but as I've discussed with uh, the Brazil thing and even, and even prior, I don't see how the deal doesn't go through. Microsoft still has a lot of leverage here where not only are they not the market leader, which yes, um, the, the CMA does identify that, but they just they have that kind of leverage to say, we're not market leaders, we're trying something different, we're still gonna make these games for PlayStation. Here's some proof with Mo Yang from 2014, right? That's a very long documented history. So they have a lot of things working for them rather than against them. But yeah, there's gonna be some scrutiny and they will have to publish a very thorough response uh, trying to you know, quell those, quell those fears. It is interesting though to see the CMA distinguish not only the exclusivity of it, but rather the competitive nature of how the game might release on more favorable terms for Microsoft versus PlayStation, which in this case would be Game Pass, where Microsoft confirmed today, yes, these games, Overwatch, Diablo, uh, Call of Duty, they're going to be on Game Pass, and that is where it's going to be not great for a PlayStation owner, where you're going to have to pay 70 bucks. That is the have it cake and eat it too situation I've posed with Microsoft's big publisher acquisitions where I don't see why they wouldn't approach it that way. And it seems like that is what they're planning on doing, at least in this short to medium term. Um, I still wouldn't expect anything crazy here. Uh, I'm sure we'll see their response at some point. And um, again, I don't see any major hurdles. This is certainly business as usual, but uh, we'll have more progress updates on what is such a crazy massive acquisition for this industry. Now moving on, this was really out of nowhere, but the TV showrunner, producer, and scriptwriter uh, Michael Jonathan on Twitter confirmed that season one is done for Twisted Metal. That was totally random because at least for the HBO series, that was highly publicized. We've seen the progress on that from start to finish. Even the Uncharted movie, we saw a lot of that as well. But for the Twisted Metal series, we didn't see much of anything, just the announcement, the synopsis, and boom, it's done. Michael also says in a follow-up tweet here, and I quote, The cast and crew of Twisted Metal was something special. Even with lightning delays, extreme heat, and cars that wouldn't do as they're told, everyone worked as hard as they could to make sure Twisted Metal kicked as much as possible. The last day of shooting felt like the last day of camp, with lots of laughs, a few tears, and ice cream being handed out of the back of Sweet Tooth's truck. We all cannot wait for you to see this insane thing we spent our summer shooting. Now to post. So, looks like the show is uh, on the way, which, again, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about this IP in particular. I can see how they'll go with the comedy angle of it, but it's just so random, like, boom, we're done. <laughs> so, that was surprising, but uh, another PlayStation Productions update. Uh, the trailer for this, I think, is going to, going to generate a very interesting conversation online, no doubt about that. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games.
those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was looking at a very cool, uh, kind of unusual PSP model that a lot of folks don't seem to know about. It's the PSP Street or PSP E1000. Always love doing some PSP stuff, so go check out that. And then we got to be close to a uh, potential showcase. You know, anybody, anybody's guess is good at this point, but it should be soon. We'll see. Whatever happens, we'll probably do some kind of conversation right away. But uh, until then, that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Lost Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.